My friends, uh, the most recent example of this is uh, St. Ambrose. St. Ambrose was the guy who instructed and uh, baptized St. Augustine. So this is the 4th century, uh, 300 something. Anyway, he's the one who said, uh, most uh, clearly in my memory, is that this Jesus, the Lord and Master of our lives, this Jesus who is calling each of us to be his disciples, to change our lives, to move in close to his circle of formation and life, to be a disciple, to have a, a life that is under reconstruction. That might be the best way for us to image uh, a discipleship life. It is one that is consciously and intentionally being reshaped around the model and the friendship and the love and the grace of Jesus the Master. This Master, Jesus, by his death and now the miraculous re resurrection and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, this Jesus has moved from his position in history and he has moved into a place of mystery. And to St. Ambrose and to the Greek language that they were speaking and the Latin language that they were speaking, uh, mystery is what the word they use for sacrament. Sisters and brothers, this is the greatest declaration the Catholic Church has, is that this Jesus of ours, who they hung on a tree and they killed, they persecuted and they denied, has uh, been buried in the ground and has been raised to new life and has now moved from his mission of teaching and discipleship and mastering to the presence and the central, central position of the sacraments of our Catholic Church. And so this Easter time, I've been trying to go through the sacraments and uh, to bring to our, open our minds, my mind and yours, and our hearts to the fact that there is something more here than simply the body and blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ in the sacrament, which is an outward sign of an inward grace. You may recognize some of those things. Those are your catechism definitions of what a sacrament is and what the real presence of Jesus is here on the altar, the body and blood, soul, and divinity. I'd like to just... You know, the bishops of our country have kind of, they, they've really been knocked off their game uh, about, uh, well, you know, the pandemic. So everybody, they closed down all the churches. So now this has them troubled, obviously. And so, and uh, many of us are not coming back to church. So that also has them troubled. And, uh, and besides, before the pandemic, 75% of us weren't coming to church. So that had them troubled. And then, wouldn't you know, come to find out, these Pew Research people, they went and asked all you good and faithful practicing Catholics, uh, what do you believe about the uh, Jesus in the Eucharist? Do you believe in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist? Is the body and blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus? And only 30% of the practicing Catholics could agree with that statement. So now they have set for us a Eucharistic revival, a three-year process by which we are going to and a little bit to my uh, dismay, we are going to reconsider again the catechism definition of what it is to have the real presence of Jesus in the Holy Eucharist, body and blood, soul and divinity. Why is that a little bit disturbing to me? Is because if you remember my Lenten preaching and now my Easter preaching, is that I'm afraid that... We conscripted Catholics, those of us who were born into a Catholic family, our parents baptized us, and then through the rather boot camp-like process of catechism, or you're going to Catholic school, you're going to catechism class, I don't care if you hate it. Father, can you imagine 16 years of Catholic education? I said, well, that sounds like a real punishment. Yeah, 16 years of Catholic education. And of course, all the parents, you know what they say to me? Father, can you believe this? 16 years, 21 years, 20 years of Catholic education. And not one of my kids goes to church anymore. If I hear that one more time, if I had a dime for each time I heard that in the last 40 years, I'd be, uh, well, we'd have another wing on this building, that's for sure. <clears throat> so the, through the process of catechism, 
I'm calling the rigor in the boot camp of catechism and sacramentalization. We got our con we, you're ma we made our first Holy Communion. That, you're making your confirmation. I don't care. You know, you want to eat dinner? You're making your confirmation. You know what I mean? The, and then, uh, well, and this generate my generation. And you're getting married. You're, we're going to get your call father and get yourself up there. Matter of fact, I'm going to call father and make sure that you have a wedding in the Catholic Church. You're a Catholic. That's the way we do things, right? So through catechism and sacraments, we have uh, disciplined generations of Catholics to follow the rules and to practice the rituals. You all know when to bless yourselves, genuflect, stand, sit, you know, how to make the act of contrition. What I'm afraid of, is that in all of that process, no, so nobody has introduced you to Jesus. No one has convinced you that like those disciples of old, sitting around that table, sitting around this table, that you are not here to practice, say the creed, practice the rituals, uh, experience the sacrament. Yes, you are here for all that. This is how this preaching has been going, right? I'm not criticizing the end, and I'm so glad you're here. But what I'm saying, there's more here than body and blood, soul, and divinity. I want, think of the last time you went uh, and had a meaningful and powerful experience of your spouse, let's say. Maybe a romantic encounter, if I could say such thing on Sunday morning. Uh, or how about uh, you got together with that grandchild of yours, you haven't seen him for six months. Or that son of yours is coming in from out of town, you know. Uh, mama's favorite, you're not allowed to say that. But mama's favorite is coming in from out of town. And so you're, you have this meeting with them. You have this experience of them. I doubt, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, I doubt that you went and told somebody else, got on the phone, and said, oh, I got to experience the real presence of my loved one, body, blood, and soul. We just don't talk that way, sisters and brothers. That doesn't make any sense to us. Remember this, how many souls are on the airplane, you know, on the vessel, right? That's 18th century language. Yes, we talk about souls, but that's not the way we, 21st century people, or 20th century people, we don't talk about uh, sub substance and accidents. Of the Catholic Church, we do. You can see that my concern is that if we are going to revive our encounter with Jesus in the Holy Eucharist, it's got to be more than another a renewed catechism definition for all of us. It's got to be more than simply uh, more catechism, more rigor, more discipline, more rules, more ritual. You people have, and I, we've got it down. We know it already. What we don't know is Jesus, I'm afraid. And not that we don't know him, but I mean know him like in the biblical sense. Like encounter him, see him. And like those disciples, if we did, let's just say. So I, I, just say, I wonder if I'm meeting Jesus at the mass when I go. Well, I would say take a look again at this gospel text. Do you see what happened to those people? They, were walk they weren't walking, by the way, walking down the road. They were running. They were running out of Jerusalem because their Lord and Master, their teacher, and their hoped Messiah had just been slain, murdered, hung on a tree, and thrown in the ground dead. And they were so disappointed, heartbroken, and they were scared out of their wits because what those people that did that to him, you know who they're coming after next is us. And we, the two of us, are getting out of town. That's what they were doing. They were running in fear and discouragement and disappointment out of Jerusalem and going to the hill country. And you know what Jesus came and said to them in as much as, hey, guys, you're walking the wrong direction. Sounds like, hey, Peter, hey, Andrew, hey, John, hey, James, come and follow this direction. Stop going in the direction you're going. Come follow me. And when they got there, he broke the bread 
and in the breaking of the bread, they recognized him. And what did they do? They jumped up from their place and they ran back into the lion's den. They ran back into the flames. They ran back into the danger, the loss of life. Sisters and brothers, I don't know when the last time is that you were here and you recognized the love that Jesus has for you, the friendship that Jesus is offering you, the power that Jesus is extending to you. And it, was, it was so powerful. It was, just like that grandson or just like your uh, spouse or just like your uh, uh, love, much beloved son. It was such a powerful thing. You, had, you got up from this bench and you went running back out there. And what did you do? You expressed this love, joy, peace, renewal of life to somebody you care about out there. When was the last time? When was the last time you met Jesus and he set you on the journey out of here, not to just be happy because, oh, I love Jesus, Jesus loves me, but because I have got to tell somebody that 